Hi, my name is Agile, and I support Gen X Grown Up through Patreon, and I believe you should too. Just go to patreon.com slash genxgrownup. No life, no fun. Don't you know that you're a grown up? Gen X Grown Up is a YouTube channel website and audio podcast you're listening to right now. All made for and by people who love exploring media, games, tech, and toys of yesterday and today through the eyes of Gen Xers who refuse to grow up. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown up. Welcome back, Gen X Grown Up podcast listeners to this backtrack edition of the Gen X Grown Up podcast. I am John. Joining me as always is George. Hey, how's it going, guys? And Mo is here. Hey, everybody. The backtrack is, as you probably already know, the episode where we take a single nostalgic topic and dig in deep. In the late 80s and early 90s, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign strove to keep our nation's youth from illicit drug use. The approach and effectiveness of the program is often debated, but there's no debate that it was front and center if you grew up as a Gen Xer in the U.S. So in this episode, we'll be exploring the history, effects, and legacy of Just Say No. But first, I'm going to say yes to a fourth listener email. That's what you did there. But yeah, can I use the yes no? Get it? Right. <laughs> From Matt Man, uh, actually the co-host of the Deep Fried Geeks podcast. And Matt Man wrote in with a subject line, Star Trek Debates. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Matt says, that Star Trek debate episode was great. Sound quality on point, the swerve of Mo hosting, the bickering, just a solid, entertaining episode. <laughs> the bickering. They, come- <laughs> they love the bickering. Yeah. They come for the content, they stay for the bickering. <laughs> And that comes from a guy who isn't really that big of a Trek fan. Wow. It was so legit and so much fun. I'm probably going to listen to it again and may even start watching the next generation. (laughs) LOL. (laughs) George, our recruitment tool has worked. We've gotten someone else to watch Star Trek. Well done. Well, you know, (laughs) as long as they get something beneficial out of it, even though it was a big cheat and a scam, but that's okay. It it was none of those things. It was none of those things. It was legit. Yeah. Say the two people in on the conspiracy. (laughs) We had oversight. Don't worry. It was fine. With who? Well, the host of the show was keeping track that everything was on the level. That's right. Yeah. That's not how that works when the host is one of the conspirators. (laughs) Oh, okay. Maybe there should have been some checks and balances, but I assure you, (laughs) nothing untoward was going on. That's great, Matt, man. We, well, we love that you enjoyed the episode and we obviously enjoy that you wrote in. Uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, if you would like to have your email read here on the show, just hit us up at podcast at genxgrownup.com. We read them all. Most of them make it right here into the mail segment of the show. All right. I would ask you if you're ready to get into the show, but even if you were ready, you'd probably say no. But Mo, George, want to talk about just say no? No. No. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's do it anyway after this break. It's <laughs> a good pot for you. No. Cocaine? No, thanks. Yo, my man, you want some nudes? No what? If someone offers you drugs, instead of saying something you really don't mean, just say, No! Got some sense a million for you. No. No. No big production number. Just say, No! You'd be surprised how well it works. I- no! What are they doing letting us in a place this nice? Now streaming on Hulu, John Cena and Lil Rel Howery are bringing trouble to paradise. Gaz, I need you to be really cool. When have we ever not been cool? <laughs> Vacation Friends 2 on Hulu. And there's more. I want some more. When you add Disney Plus to Hulu for just $2 more a month. Hallelujah! With Blackish, Deadpool 2, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And you're just telling me now? The Hulu and Disney Plus bundle. Plans starting at just $9.99 a month. All of these and more now streaming. 18 plus only. Access content from each service separately. Offer valid for eligible subscribers only. Terms apply. Even though both Mo and George said no, we are going to talk about the Just Say No campaign. Now, Just Say No, if you're not familiar, maybe you're not a Gen Xer or you just want a refresher, uh, it was an advertising campaign prevalent during the 80s and 90s, and it was the child-facing part of the U.S.'s war on drugs, aimed to discourage right. children from engaging in illicit recreational drug use by giving them various ways to just say no when they are offered any kind of drugs from anyone, right? Yeah, I mean, that was the idea anyway. It was, it was, and we're going to talk about its efficacy and kind of its impacts Mm -hmm. in a minute, but what it was is what we were covering here. Well, let's start with the phrase itself. The campaign is called Just Say No, and it seems obvious, uh, you know, but but actually it has a little bit of an origin story, right? Yeah. uh, 1982, Nancy Reagan, she's touring around a bunch of different elementary schools, and she's in Oakland, California at Longfellow Elementary School. And this little schoolgirl walks up to her and says, hey, what do I do if one of my friends offers me drugs? Mm -hmm. And the first lady just all she did was 
would just say no. And <laughs> from that point, I'm sure some of her handlers heard it and, mm-hmm. you right. know, they were like, oh, we got to write that down. That's, you know, awesome. And so, <laughs> oh my God, it's brilliant. Yeah. And it ended up becoming the phrase that ended up getting just used over and over and over in every piece of media campaign, all the different commercials and PSAs that you would see all over the airwaves at that point. It was on radio stations, t shirt. I mean, it's nuts. Yeah. TV shows. I mean, it was everywhere. Yeah. At its face value, it seems, and it is very, very well meaning and very, very pure. It's like, look, well, there's all this peer pressure, and, you know, there's other kids that are doing drugs, they're offering it to me. And it's just a clear, well, just don't just ways to do it. And they did it almost like an anti-bullying campaign. It's like, stand on your own feet. Just, you know, you be stronger and you say no. But it was really emblematic of more that was going on in the United States, really the world, but especially here in the U.S. If the war on drugs that Ronald Reagan was leading was like a Sherman tank, this just say no was like this pretty bike flag waving on top of it, right? It was (laughs) was the friendly facing part of what was this juggernaut that was rolling over the U.S. or starting to at that time, this war on drugs kicked off. I mean, the war on drugs had started much earlier than that. Nixon was actually the president that started the war on drugs, but Reagan mm-hmm. was the one who really drove it home because that was one of his campaign promises. Okay. And yeah, he, yeah. he started on it right away. 1980, he started major funding efforts for the DEA, uh, for different tactical units within the police forces. And they were doing all this militaristic stuff, but this Just Say No campaign gave it a smooth coat of paint. It made it look good to the American public. That's what this whole campaign was designed to do. I know that, yes, it's a simplistic phrase, and that's why I got a lot of criticism and everything, but the whole point of the campaign wasn't about getting kids to just say no. Behind the scenes, it was really, <laughs> let's make this look a whole lot better than it really is, because yeah, we, it's a whole different thing that we'll get into later. You put a kind of a candy coating on what otherwise was politically questionable, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was really based in a knee-jerk reaction to the crack cocaine epidemic, which started oh in 1980. Oh, my God, that's horrible. Oh, it was yeah. blowing up then. Oh, yeah. man. I yeah. I mean, there were yeah. even movies, New Jack City. You know, mm-hmm. there were there were a lot of different things going on, and especially in the urban areas where a lot of people live, you know, paycheck to paycheck or even less. This crack cocaine thing was just sweeping through because it was so addictive, and it was so cheap because the cocaine itself was cut with millions of different chemicals and everything, and that's why it was so dangerous. You know, you're basically smoking a little bit of cocaine along and with who knows what baby else, right? powder, baby and formula, or whatever, and whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah, it was awful. It was decimating communities. Yeah, so it it's was. understandable why it seems like a no-brainer. This thing is happening. We should have a war on this thing. Mm-hmm. Well, that kind of speaks to the kind of the U.S. <laughs> mentality that you have to have a war on the thing you don't agree with. But you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to be political here. But yeah, it definitely was a a front-facing. It's for the kids. It's very clear. Just say no. You know, be strong. And I get all that, but you're right. I think it was very much kind of that knee-jerk reaction to what do we do about it really quickly and how do we make it palatable, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It was a tough spot. I would say that of the three of us, we all experienced the Just Say No campaign and the war on drugs during the 80s, but I would think Mo probably had as much or more experience than you and I did, John, because he grew up in New York uh, during that time frame. I would think that you had quite a bit of experience with that, right, Mo? Especially in your school. personal experience. No, but... Well, no, but I mean, like, the campaign itself. Oh, exposure to it, right. It was everywhere. It was posters, and I mean, it was, you know, especially going to a public school, I mean, it was... Literally, you couldn't turn around and not see this freaking slogan. It became like wallpaper, didn't it? Yeah, like, it really just was. Yeah, it really was. We had buttons, pens. I mean, you know, it was it was ridiculous how much stuff we had. Well, to George's point, do you think it was even more pronounced being in in, in the big city like that? Oh, I would say probably. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Right, it's hard to make a comparison. That's your yeah, experience. That was, right. that was my reality, you know. So right. I don't know yeah. what else was there. But I can definitely tell you that. I mean, especially you know, we heard about the stories, like you said, crack cocaine and all the other stuff. That was stuff that was happening. In New York, it was it was happening in the areas happening to people sure. we knew, oh, yeah. you know, and so and we'll go into this later as far as the effectiveness, but yeah, it, they were definitely pushing it hard because one, you know, Nancy Reagan, very charismatic person, mm-hmm. very. Yep. You know, a lot of people trusted her for you know not bad reasons at all. You know, I think sure. she was a really good person, but just the way it kind of it, it was a very of us word like Reagan was almost seemed like the grandpa if you remember back then. <laughs> you know, and okay. she was like the grandmother of the of the country. Well, I would say that Nancy Reagan was probably the last of the great first ladies, and I'm not saying that what she did or didn't do was awesome or not awesome. I'm just saying that 
what we viewed as a first lady. She was kind of the last of that ilk of the Jackie Kennedys and like getting causes. Yeah, because after that, I mean, what do you really go into? Almost borderline royalty in some ways, right? It's yeah, you go into elevated. Clinton next, and you know, I Hillary Clinton's a, a superb individual. She's accomplished a lot in her life, but she was never viewed in the same light that the first ladies were before her. Later first ladies, they almost stand on their own. They're they're strong in their own right. They're not just the first lady. They kind of have their own political agenda. Whereas, right. yeah, I, I, if I pick up what you're saying, it's almost yeah. Nancy Reagan was kind of the last one of those. I'm kind of a sidecar to the president. President. I'm the warm, fluffy, friendly face to what's going on. And I think that was emblematic in the Just Say No campaign, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when we get back from the break, I'm going to talk about the campaign itself, how it manifested, and kind of the, some of the strategies that they use. So right after this. Kid, I really want to let kids know that illegal drugs are bad news. Yes, David, it's true. Over 100,000 teenagers were admitted into hospitals last year because of drugs. Yeah, but I'm talking about kids' futures. Did you know that marijuana can affect a person's physical and sexual growth? Yes, that's quite accurate. In a laboratory test, female animals treated with the active component in marijuana experienced a 44% death rate among their offspring. This is much more important than facts and figures. What kids should know is that marijuana has got more cancer-causing agents than tobacco, and a lot of young kids use drugs on a daily basis. Hit Pass Moto, sponsored by Moto America, is the show that keeps you up to speed on the latest in motorcycling and brings the biggest names in motorcycle racing right to you. From candid interviews with the top names in racing to providing insights into the trends and trendsetters driving the motorcycle industry, we have you covered. New episodes are available every Thursday at pitpassmoto.com and on your favorite podcast app. Ride on! We were just talking about how it was like literally everywhere in my school Mm -hmm. streets. I mean, this campaign, I mean, I don't know how much money they put into this, but let (laughs) me tell you, T-shirts, bumper stickers, it was on TV. We saw a bunch of like TV shows were talking about it. This thing was literally everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the areas that I saw it the most in, I lived here in Tallahassee and we had a grocery store in what would be considered the poor area of town. So I saw the effects of drugs and especially crack cocaine firsthand, just like you did, Mo, in mm-hmm. New York, I would think. But one of the strangest mediums, and I, I mean, looking back on it, yeah, it makes sense. You're targeting children. So, of course, this is a medium you were going to use. But it was everywhere in comic books. They even had really huge (laughs) storylines. Speedy, the Green Arrow's sidekick, was killed by a drug overdose during this time. Yeah. I had no idea. Uh, Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I forgot about that. One of my favorite books of all times are the uh, New Teen Titans. I love that series. Right. And during that time frame, they had a set of five or so comic books that were published about the war on drugs, just say no. And they were published and sponsored by different companies. Keebler put one out. There was another one from this agency over here and that agency Mm -hmm. over there. Right. But it was all in comic books at that point. Huh. Wow. And of course, they picked the, the superhero named Speedy. Right. That well, that was <laughs> kind of part of the thing that people have talked about since then, right? right? You know, <laughs> Kind of coincidentally odd, right? <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't lost on the writers who created it. Yeah. Well, the other thing also is just the education. Like, I mean, we had special classes. I don't know. Did you guys have those? Like, they had special people come to your school and talk to you about it. and Like speakers, right? Yeah. Let me tell you mm-hmm. about what terrible things happened to me and why you shouldn't start, right? Yeah, the, exactly. One of, of the biggest yep. parts of those programs I mean, Dare. Dare was spawned out of this. And that was really one of the main, you know, you had these police officers coming and handing out T-shirts and talking to you in your classroom. And and they they really kind of did some stuff that was very controversial. One of the things I... I was a young person and I picked up on how bad this was. They started using kids at that age, almost like undercover informants, like come tell us, you know, when your friends are doing drugs and we'll save you and protect you. And we won't let anybody know that you told us and everything. They're turning us all into little snitches, essentially. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I remember like when that happened with, uh, they came and did that talk at our school and of course, we all looked at each other like, is he crazy? <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's like, really? Did, did he just say that? You know, and this is being junior high school saying this, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think this probably went over really well in elementary school age kids. But like once you get of into course. your mid teens, you're starting to identify with who you are in life. And, and now that this is the establishment telling you what's cool. And what's the natural reaction to what the establishment says? It's the opposite. (laughs) I think it's great that we're all two years apart because we can all 
sharing a different part of the experience. Dare started in 1983 by Daryl Gates, the LAPD chief guy who was, you know, very controversial. I was 12 when that thing started. So John, that would have made you 14 and Mo, that would have made you 16. Yeah. So we were all in our teens, really just about, but there's different perspectives on that. As a 12 year old, I bought into it. Sure. I was like, yes, just say no, dare, blah, blah, blah. But as a 16 year old Mo, I would think you would oh. have a little bit more experience and probably you're like, this is some bullshit. It, it, was, it, was, it was almost like it, we liked the classes because it means we didn't have to take one of our regular classes. Right. <laughs> it and was assembly, the substitute fantastic. teacher day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. You know, it's like, oh, you got to forget assembly on this. Like, oh, cool. No math test today. You know, I mean, it was like. At least it's not social studies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the problem is, I don't think they tailed it for the different ages properly. Well, certainly not not different parts of the program. They were targeted yeah. towards certain age groups. I think D.A.R.E. was, like John said, targeted toward the elementary age kids. Yeah. But yep. I think that there was another aspect of the campaign that was more far reaching, I think, than D.A.R.E. Uh, that was all those celebrity PSAs that kept coming out. I think they tried to tailor those to a larger age range to varying degrees of success. Well, they yeah. pulled in like rock and roll stars and stuff mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. like Captain which, Lou Albano Which is the did epitome one. of funny <laughs> now right it's yeah. like aerosmith is up there don't do drugs kids mother that's your whole damn career yeah. you're stoned right now <laughs> reminds me of a tiny bit that sam kennison did on one of his albums where he said rock against drugs that's like christians against christ that's exactly what you're there for <laughs> One of the other kind of offshoot programs that came out of this was that whole "Don't this is your brain on drugs." Oh, those PSA, those yeah, were cracking hilarious. the egg in the pan, right? Holy shit, those things are funny. They always came out like '87. The very first one that came out was like, wow, I thought that was pretty powerful. Was that the frying pan in the air? Yeah, the frying pan. The very first one. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Right. Any yep, questions? Right. And that was Any it. questions? Right. And they dropped it. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, okay, that was interesting. But then I guess they had to keep going with it. And then they just kept kind of upping the stakes on it. And they yeah, had one where right. somebody's like wrecking a building or a house or a room or something like that oh, with a pan. And I think the funniest one is the one that they showed much later on in the Harold and Kumar film. They're sitting there and they're high is kites you know smoking pot on the couch and one of those commercials comes up and it's these two kids and he's like i've never tried this before and he smokes just a little bit of marijuana and he's like i'm so high and he pulls the shotgun trigger in his mouth he's like no this is drugs kill or something like that yeah and you know that was an actual commercial that had to be a commercial at that time because it was so bad it was so after school special horrible oh my god i mean at its core, the Just Say No campaign was well-meaning. Yeah, yeah. But it was also, the, as you said, George, it was the face for this behemoth on war on drugs that – so, yeah, well, we're going to talk about its effectiveness in a minute. But, you know, just the approach to promoting drug awareness with such simplistic terms, just say no, as if it were that easy. You know, if mm-hmm. it were that easy, like, like sharing those commercials of having a perfect body was easy, everybody would have one, right? Well, if you yeah. could just say no and not do it, no one would be addicted, right? It would be simple. Right, yeah. You just stop. Yeah, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be a fat bastard down with a bowl of M&Ms in front of me <laughs> while we're doing this podcast. <laughs> it, would be, it, was that it was easy just go get, I don't want right? to. Oh, man, you got M&Ms? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, I want, I want some M&Ms. You're right, though, John. I mean, it was definitely simplistic. Just the phrase itself is simplistic, right? I mean, it, but it needed to be in the context that she provided it. She was talking to a small elementary aged mm-hmm. young girl and she gave her a simple answer because a young girl That's a young need. child would need a simple answer right, right? they they don't want to sit down there and be lectured for 45 minutes on this drug or that drug or what these uh, no just say no it's okay honey just say no that's how it came about but then the people got a hold of it the spin doctors and the market got people promoted and to something more and yeah. they yeah. turned it into something and nancy went along for the ride don't get me wrong she was just as much a part of it as anything but I think that the people behind the scenes are the ones who really drove it oh, yeah, down yeah. our throats in yeah. a, what, in my opinion, was an incredibly negative way. You know, and from a marketing standpoint, too, I mean, I think you could argue having a simple slogan and catchphrase, that's a way to kind of seep into people's subconscious. That's oh, sure. a good idea. But no, we, still, we still remember it. Of course. That's, yeah. that's what marketing is, right? <laughs> that's a, ex- you know, exactly the right. the hook in the song. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Well, after this break, we're going to get into those effects you talked about, George. That's right after this. Jane makes her parents very proud. She's on the honor roll and plans to go to college. Starred in her class's last play. 
She plays clarinet in the school orchestra. Yes, Jane knows about drugs. In a way, she's lucky she knows better. Some people don't realize that marijuana and driving don't mix. But Jane's brother reminds her every day that some trips last forever. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast. All right, gentlemen, I think it's about time we quit beating around the bush, so to speak, and got into the effects of the Just Say No campaign. Mm -hmm. I have a very strong opinion <laughs> about this campaign <laughs> that might have seeped through a little bit. That's good. In Fine. some of yeah, our previous yeah, yeah. segments. Nothing wrong with opinions. But I think there's no question that it definitely increased public awareness of drug use. Yeah. If it did nothing else positive, it definitely increased our awareness. Now, how it filtered that awareness and how it bent that awareness to its will, that's a different <laughs> subject, but it definitely increased our awareness. Yeah, I it totally did. agree. See, and my biggest issue with it, I, I totally agree with everything you just said, George, is that we mentioned before how it was simplistic, right? Mm -hmm. And like, drug use is not simplistic. No. Yeah. And the reasons right. why people go into it, like it didn't address any of the causes, the reasons, the social economic effects of it, the social economic reasons why people get into drugs to start with. It didn't cover any of that. It was just this very like drugs are bad. Don't do it. Yeah. Something I read, it said that it, it contributed to the thought that if you use drugs, you are a bad person because mm -hmm. you made a rational choice to become addicted to drugs. Mm -hmm. Someone asked me, I could have said yes or no. And I chose to say yes, because that was the only, it was just my free will. There were no external influences. There was, you know, no extenuating circumstances. They don't consider my socioeconomic condition. It's just like you said, yes, you're bad. And that's overly simplified. I mean, there's personal responsibility, but it, it isolated a lot of the people who started on drugs during that era for those external reasons, right? You're a person who is down on your luck. Maybe you just became homeless through no fault of your own. You know, somebody yeah. fired you for no reason or your company closed. You couldn't pay the rent and you're out on the street. You know, you're trying to find a way to escape that horror and pain, right? Somebody offers you something that'll make you feel better for 15 minutes. You're damn right. I'm taking that in that situation. I don't give a damn what anybody says. If yeah. somebody offered me something that would make me feel better and I'm not thinking rationally because of everything that's just happened to me. Hell yeah. I'm taking that drug just like a million other people probably would. Yeah, and the right. fact that they tried to label those people in the same context as people who maybe sold the drugs or did illegal things that hurt other people to get drugs. I have a whole different philosophy. <laughs> that I'm, I'm it's biting my layered. It's, yeah. it's not point A to point B. Exactly. It is a scatter shot of data and influencing and extenuating circumstances that lead to that. It's not as simple as, Hey, Miss Reagan, what do I say? Just say no. Oh, yeah. well, shit, my problem is solved. Thank you. It's <laughs> right. not that easy, yeah. right? It's like, I don't consider myself to be a stupid person by any stretch, but I smoked. Mm -hmm. I smoked for yeah. years. I started when I was like 18. Because I, looking back, I realized when I was 18, I didn't know what the hell was I was doing. Well, was now let's stupid. let's clarify that. Do you mean cigarettes or do you mean marijuana or? I'm starting. I'm, I'm going to talk about cigarettes here for right now. Sure. We'll go into my college years later. But, first, <laughs> <laughs> but for right now, though, it was just, you know, I smoked cigarette and I smoked for a, a good 10 years. But that's a, mm -hmm. But that's exactly part of the point. You did something that was totally legal. You started at 18 and yeah. you smoked a drug that was sold in stores. Oh, yeah stores everywhere around you and that was something that was promoted by the government on tv at that time even there were still commercials selling cigarettes in the 80s on television the kids today they have no clue what that means there were magazine oh, ads yeah. the marlboro man all that stuff out there they were fine promoting that thing that we all know now is cancerous as hell is arguably more detrimental to your health than the illicit drugs. Exactly. Some of them, right? <laughs> and the thing is that, and, and I knew like intellectually as a kid, I knew that cigarette smoking was bad. We knew about lung cancer. We knew about yeah, emphysema. Right. We knew about but all that stuff. But we were just stuff, starting right? to learn that though. 
Yeah, but we were. But the, the truth is, though, is like I think Chris Rock had a whole stand up thing about how like why he didn't do a lot of bad things as a kid. He's like, I didn't do drugs because it was bad for me. I didn't do drugs because I knew my dad would kick my ass. Right. <laughs> and that was that was similar for me. My dad, I remember one time I was like maybe eight, nine years old. And he looked at me and he said, now, I know that you're going to be working at the grocery store and there's going to be people with drugs around and everything. I'll tell you this flat out. You can do all the drugs you want. But the first time I catch you, I'm putting my fist down your throat. After that, you do whatever the hell you want in your own house. <laughs> I'm like, damn. Yeah. I'm like, OK, daddy. That's right. Now, if Nancy Reagan had said that, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I hate the term illicit drug use especially in the context that we're talking about right now. Illicit has that negative connotation. Not all drug use, which I hate being lumped into one group, is illicit. Uh, I would argue that alcohol and cigarettes are way more illicit than marijuana. Yeah. Well, Ill illicit means illegal by the current laws. Oh, does it? I thought it meant bad. So well, I see, to your, to your Nancy point, Reagan though, brainwashed me back well, in see, there, Yeah, right. She did. Yeah. She, she just say no you into a way of thinking, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, and studies since the just say no kind of campaign have tried to go, okay, what did it do? What did it do? What did it do? And no study that I can find has drawn any direct correlation between just say no mm -hmm. and reduced illegal drug use. Yeah. No. Just, there is no evidence that says that, good job, that fixed it, or even helped no, dramatically. it's all very corollary or whatever that word is, where it's like, it happens, but they don't necessarily relate one to the just other. coincidentally no, yeah. happened. To, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Causation versus correlation. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, same thing with D.A.R.E. You know, D.A.R.E. is still going on to this day. Yep, and yeah. yep. there's nothing out there that's shown that it's had a positive influence on what it says it wants to do. Well, now, there are a couple of studies I saw that say that people who were enrolled in D.A.R.E. or D.A.R.E.-like programs were actually more likely to use cigarettes and alcohol than if they had not been. Well, of course, because those are legal. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, I really can't have the bad ones. I've got to enjoy the ones I am allowed to right. have, I guess. I, yeah, I don't know why. I'm not going to smoke this plant, but damn, give me that tar and fiberglass right now. <laughs> give, give me the other plant. I'll smoke that one instead. That one's okay. <laughs> one of the effects I think where it really hurt us is, especially for like, and even though marijuana was illegal, it still is in most places, we look at the whole gateway drug concept that it promoted. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, oh, if you start with this, then you're going to go into this. Or everybody who starts with this, you know, everyone who started smoking <sighs> obviously moved on to drugs. Yeah. And that's, again, that whole correlation versus causation thing. Just because B followed A, it does not mean that, that A caused B. Right. Right. So it's yeah. like, well, it could be that everyone who drank milk got into drugs. Yeah. You know, I mean, because, yeah. you know, we get right well, down to it. To that it's, end, water is the ultimate gateway drug, right? Right. Well, you all started on water. <laughs> and look what that led to. 100% <laughs> of people who drank water got drugs. You know? It's your mother's yeah. fault for all that damn breast milk. That's it. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> it's a killer. <laughs> yeah. And especially, like you said, in the poor communities and minority communities and stuff, you know, that's where you really saw like people getting arrested over just <sighs> minor oh, drug charges. For me, now this we're going to get the, into the stuff that this pisses is me off. The yeah. worst part of this entire war on drugs and the war. And again, I, we're trying not to get political at all. Just, oh, I'm going to get political. I, I know, <laughs> but it's hard. It's hard. But. You talked about, George, you know, your, your store was in, you know, a less affluent community. Mm -hmm. And invariably, this war on drugs had such a racial impact because lower income communities tended to be minority communities. They enforced drug rules more and more heavily in those poor communities. Mm -hmm. And so a huge spike in how many minority men and women were incarcerated, put in jail, their lives wrecked, large swaths of it stolen in, in prison because why? They were smoking marijuana or they had possession of X amount of crack cocaine or something. Those people needed help not their lives further ruined. You yeah, know, there's, it's, there's no oh, doubt. I don't care. Nobody will convince me otherwise of this subject, but I am, I'm convinced it was a conscious effort on the part of our government to recreate a new slave organization. I don't care what I, anybody I, says. I, I the, think there are undercurrents of that. You know, I don't know how overt that was, but there certainly is, there's evidence to point to that, isn't there? I mean, yeah. well, you're talking about, I mean, think about what happened to those people that got arrested. Number one, they got crazy jail sentences under the Just Say No and the D.A.R.E. campaigns. Ridiculous. Yeah, the three strike rules too. Yeah, oh, mm -hmm. the three strike rules. Oh right. my God. Yeah, just ridiculous amounts of stuff. 
it, I've always viewed it like this. You should be allowed to put into your body whatever the hell you want. There's no government that should ever tell you you can't put glass in your throat. If you want to put fucking glass in your throat, put fucking glass in your throat. That's all I'm saying. But when you commit a crime, not the consumption or possession of the drug, but you go and steal a TV from somebody, okay, you need to go to jail for that. And Thank you. Thank the, you. Yes. You know, yes. that thing you get arrested for and there's a commensurate amount of punishment based on what you do. Yeah. But not what I do with myself. That's none of your goddamn business. Right. If you say that this thing is illegal, that's fine if you say that. But the fact that I choose to put it in my body, that's one thing. If you say it's illegal because it's going to make me do X, Y, and Z, but I don't, I would not have ever have done that, stolen that TV you're talking about. You're punishing me. It's presumptive. It's, it's absolutely a minority report. It's like, oh, we found yeah. who's who's smoking dope. Yep. Go arrest them because they're mm -hmm. about to do something illegal. Exactly. No, that's, that's not the case. Yeah. That's, and I don't know how many of you guys have been around people that smoke marijuana. I've never smoked it myself because I was terrified by just say no. And then later <laughs> and on, dad. once I grew some intelligence, <laughs> and my dad, I grew some intelligence. I already had some lung issues. And so I was a little bit, you know, cautious of putting mm -hmm. anything into my lungs that wasn't just air. Um, although, depending upon where you live, that could be a bad thing, too, I guess. <laughs> but people who are smoking marijuana are the least likely people to go out and fuck with other people. Oh, my God. They're so laid back and relaxed. Unless they have Doritos. I have never heard of a person smoking marijuana and then knocking over a liquor store. Right. <laughs> they yeah. might stumble in and knock over a shelf, maybe. Yeah, but... they might have, like, they maybe they shoplifted some Cheetos, maybe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> might yeah. be the worst crime. I smoked pot. I smoked, you know, in college just especially. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, I mean, part of it was probably because it was illegal and all that stuff and, you know, makes you feel like, you know, especially as a young teenager. But the thing that gets me is just the, I guess the idea how the difference between, again, not saying not to keep, you know, again, this isn't a political thing. If you look at just the pure, what effect did it have? Did it help? Are we seeing less drug use today? Are we seeing, did we have a, a generation that grew up doing less drugs because of all these programs? Do we have nope. you know, less money being made because of these programs? No. Nope. Do we have, you know, nope. instead <laughs> we're spending more and more and more money yep. and it's not effective. I'm thinking just from an economics, evidently something that we're doing is not working. And at some point we need to change it. Well, it depends on what you consider to be effective, right? So from sure. our point of view, looking at it as logical human beings, it's completely ineffective for what they told us it wanted to do. But I would argue that there's a definite possibility that it was extremely effective for ulterior motives that people who were not poor, who were affluent and rich, might have wanted to see happen. To keep the disadvantage down, possibly. Yep. And to, to widen yep. the pay gaps and all mm -hmm. different other kinds of things. I mean, if you think about it, the middle class has really had a big struggle. We used to have this huge Absolutely. middle class 50s, 60s, 40s, mm -hmm. yep. even into the 70s. In 70s. Yeah, 70s. Yeah. But 80s on, what the hell happened? Yeah. yeah. And you also look at the difference between how that was treated, like people do crack versus people who are addicted to pain pills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. we feel bad for them. If you're addicted to pain pills... You probably, you have insurance, you went to the doctor, you got a prescription, you start abusing that. Yeah. Oh, we're going to get into some that's stuff different. in the legacy section coming okay. up. Don't worry, that's guys. Right? We're getting right. into that. Coming yeah, up right? Soon. I do want to point out, I think one of the main effects, though, of the Just Say No campaign was really a brainwashing of a certain generation's age group. Now, the Generation X has a wide range of age groups, right? And I think that people who grew up that were around my age, born in you know, 70, 71, 72, you know, that area, we're still Gen Xers, but yeah. we were more susceptible to the brainwashing effects of the Just Say No campaign and the D.A.R.E. campaign than I think Mo's group was. Even though we're both Gen Xers, we're lumped into that same broader category. You guys were a little bit further along in your mental acuity and development than we were. So we just bought into the whole thing. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. friends of mine just, oh, yeah, Police officer Dan said, tell him whenever we see somebody doing crack and that little white thing looks like crack. So I'm telling him, you know, you're getting in trouble. I remember conversations like that in school. I mean, they were joking sometimes, but at the same time, now I look back on it going, damn, they really had us snowed the fuck in. Well, it's like, you know, that said, be a narc indoctrination, right? It's, it, mm -hmm. it's bad. You should say no. And if someone else didn't, they're bad and they're, they, they're in trouble, right? And if you don't tell on them, you're bad too. You're bad for not doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Crime of omission. That's right. <laughs> okay. Right after the break, we're going to get into that legacy stuff we're talking about. In hindsight, just say no. It's success we've talked about, but uh, it's it's lasting legacy. We're going to get right after this. Cool. I get angry just thinking about it. It makes me mad. Little kids doing drugs. It turns my stomach. 
that stuff hurts. It stops you from living up to your potential. It holds you back. It hurts the user. It hurts his family. And it hurts his friends. I just want to shake some sense into you kids that are using drugs and thinking about using it. So remember, don't or else. Hello, and welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book. And together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts. Just Say No had its campaign in the 80s and early 90s. And we mentioned the D.A.R.E. campaign is kind of adjunct parallel to that is still around. But as a campaign itself that Nancy Reagan spearheaded in that Gen X uh, in our youth, that era, uh, looking back now on what it means, what it did, what were its pluses and minuses, let's talk a little bit about the legacy of that program. Well, I think, first of all, there was a fundamental misunderstanding of how drugs relate to other crimes because all the drug, the banned substances were lumped into one category called drugs, right? Sure. So if yep. you're talking yep. about crack There's, there was cocaine, no differentiation, no shades yeah, of gray. it's a mm-hmm. different conversation conversation than if you're talking about marijuana. If you're talking about cocaine itself, it's a different conversation than if you're talking about heroin, Mm -hmm. right? And different mixtures of those drugs and different combinations. And none of that stuff was done during that era. There was no education into that aspect of it. It was just say no. That was Mm -hmm. it. Just say no. Doesn't matter Mm -hmm. what it is. If it's illegal, if we've told you it's a crime, just say no. But you know, when you turn 18, grab a pack of smokes, Johnny, and smoke up because <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, there, there's an arbitrary decision made by a governing body that says plant A is okay, even though it's detrimental. Plant B is not because we believe it's detrimental. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, all right, I guess. I don't, I don't buy it though, right? Well, again, I think it was just that very overly simplistic view of, of what it was. You know, like you said, like, Again, the whole gateway drug concept, which Mm -hmm. is a lot of crap, but they said that things like that were still, it was people who have never experienced it, I think, or haven't been around it, trying to come up with policies that they didn't understand. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 I had not considered that, but you're right. Yeah. That, yeah. Cause you look at Nancy Reagan back then. I don't think she'd done a lot of crack. Right. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> she's skinny as hell, but right. I don't think she did a lot of crack. And how many people walked up to Nancy and tried to offer her a joint? You know, how often do you think that happened? It's easy to explain, just say no, when you've not been asked the question in the same context that it was asked to others. That's tough. Although mm-hmm. considering his failing memory later on, I got to think Ronnie did a few drugs back on the sets of the old <laughs> Western TV shows and movies he was a part of. Hey, I I don't begrudge him that. That's fine. <laughs> no, I'm not saying he, but that's what I'm, I mean. Like he has this whole war on drugs and I'm like, you know, you did some drugs. I've seen some of your movies. There's no way. <laughs> you did a movie with a monkey. Come on now. <laughs> <Right>? Exactly. <laughs> Well, organizations like D.A.R.E. are still around, but yeah. I mean, both internally and externally, many people say that drug education culture needs a full overhaul. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, Take absolutely the, yeah. the things we learned from the, the, the war on drugs and the just say no campaigns and understand the things that, look, we're just three knuckleheads on a podcast and we <laughs> get, we understand some of the nuances of why this didn't work. Why can't that be absorbed and reprocessed to improve, to help people that have these addictions, you know? Well, I think it's mainly because you still have that thing that I think is in the background there where there's a control feature as part of this. We want to control the population. We want to tell them what to do. We want to make sure that they follow what we say. I think that's still a part of that. And when you have that mentality, it's hard for you to go back and say, oh, I made a mistake. Here's what we should have been doing. And here's what we're going to do going on. I don't think the government will ever get to that point without us as the individuals pushing these referendums in our local cities, counties, states. That's how, you know, marijuana has gotten passed here and there because enough of us have finally said, you guys are out of your damn mind. Marijuana (laughs) doesn't do these things. There's no kid who smokes one puff of a marijuana cigarette and then puts a shotgun in his mouth (laughs) because he's so fucking high. That doesn't happen. Yeah, right. If it does, he probably would have done that before he took the joint. He already had the shotgun in his mouth and (laughs) was putting the smoke through the shotgun like in Platoon or something like that. It's a shotgun bong. That's exactly. That's how I planned it. (laughs) 
<laughs> Talk about that overhaul too. It's many th- things coming out of just say no made it clear that what they said you should do is nothing, which is abstinence. Oh, yeah. Abstinence programs just aren't effective. I mean, we all went through sex ed. They said, just don't do it. Anybody here still a virgin? Nope. Didn't work. <laughs> you know, w- w- when, when it's black and white, when the answer is, I'm interested in this, I want to know more. No, no, no. Awful. Terrible. Stay away. It's the worst thing ever. Well, you're, if, you're, if you're young and your mind is developing, you've piqued my interest. Mm-hmm. Abstinence is not the way to convince young people to do or not do something. You don't say, don't do it. Why? Because I said so. Well, true you, I'm going to do it. It's about education, understanding the little nuances like, oh, well, what is the deal with marijuana? What is the deal with cocaine? Understand it. And not so much to say it has to be made legal, but for those that choose to do illicit drugs, they understand what they're getting into. They don't go into it blind and because they're just going against the establishment. Well, and that's a great point. I, I also don't think we need to go the whole other route and coddle the education to the thing of here's all the little facts, Johnny and Jill, and here's what we're going to do. And here, you know, there needs to be a medium there where you give enough information to let a person figure it out for themselves, but you don't try to help them make the decision. And that's my my biggest problem with the just say no campaign it was telling us what to do it was deciding for us what we should be doing with our own bodies instead of telling us if you do this here's what will happen likely to your body mm-hmm. now there was some of that they did crack the egg in the frying pan but that was a that was a <laughs> gross generalization of what the worst case scenarios probably are right, like that shot absolutely. gun commercial you were talking about yeah yeah and i think its legacy is felt in no small terms in our current opioid crisis. This is a thing Mm. that was labeled as legal and illegal in different points of our history, right? Opium Mm -hmm. and opioids have always... Poppy, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. they've gone back and forth. Get them from the pharmacy, right? Well, and now that's what's happened. The big pharma corporations, they started creating these new forms of these opioids, synthetic, natural, all these different kinds. And then because of the influence of money and greed, they talked to certain people, doctors even, into doing these crazy prescription amounts. Lobbyists. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just nuts now. And we're now starting to see the repercussions of how quickly the opioids are killing off people way more than anything else did. It's worse than crack at this point as far right. as the numbers of people who are dying on this horrible substance that is being pushed down our throats, not only by our government, but also by a large portion of our medical community, which is just horrific. <laughs> what about those illicit drugs using air quotes. Well, no, this was prescribed. It's okay. It's, exactly. It's, yeah. So as well-meaning as just say no might have been at, at the surface, it had a lot of cracks in its facade that show wow. through in its yeah, legacy. I know, I, know. Ah, I saw, not I saw what he crack. did there. <laughs> so, and Mo, you were talking earlier about how we compare, you know, what's illicit and what's not, or those kind of mm-hmm. the context of those substances, right? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You look at places like Amsterdam, which I know their drug laws have changed recently, but their thing was that if it was natural, it mm-hmm. wasn't illegal. So right. things like mushrooms, marijuana, basically couldn't be processed. So you couldn't do cocaine, heroin, right. those are all mm-hmm. illegal. But things like pot and mushrooms- If you grow it in the yard, yeah. <laughs> it, it, we're fine. And you don't really hear about Amsterdam having like this massive drug problem. Yeah. Or Funny crime that. problem either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now the flip side though, I mean, drug, I mean, I think there are some drugs that are definitely need to be illegal, right? Because not because they one, they're super addictive, they're super harmful. And to that extent, I think there has to be some rules and laws in place. But tobacco should be one of them though. That's the point. <laughs> that's the, that's pro- the hypocrisy. Problem. And that's the thing I was getting to. It's like there's a right. hypocrisy, which is that alcohol and tobacco are fine. Somehow. And we can yeah. control and regulate those, but we can't control and regulate anything else for some strange reason, which I never really understood. That may be the greatest legacy of the Just Say No campaign, hypocrisy. Yeah. Certainly complicit, if not on the bleeding edge of it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I mean, look at the way it was handled, like the way the opioid crisis is handled compared to the crack crisis that was happening. Back then, the, all the people who were in crack, it was all criminals, like you said, right? Yeah, put them in jail. It was just, they're all bad, yeah. put them in jail, right? Throw away the key. Three strikes, you're in for life. But now the <sighs> the doctor that has an opioid business, that that's all they do, and hand out millions of prescriptions 
every week or whatever. Oh, well, but they're a doctor. Let's try and be a little bit more understanding. Motherfucker, right. you weren't understanding in 1982, <laughs> asshole. Right. And for the people who were, were involved in taking all these opioids, it's like, oh, we need more treatment programs. We need to be able to get help. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, I mean, I agree. <laughs> yeah, But right. why are we doing that now for this? <laughs> well, we did ever did this before. So like I said, I, I think it's like a lot of hypocrisy. I think it's also like, you know, you try something for 40 years and it doesn't work. Maybe it's try, time to do something different. <laughs> for 40 years, right. <laughs> That's the first. <laughs> 10 wasn't a clue. Yeah. I think in hindsight, if we knew everything we knew now and we were honest with ourselves, that we would have said no to the whole just say no in the first place. Right. Or just leave, just say no to elementary school. Until until you can think about it more critically. Right. When you get a little older. Maybe. You know, yeah. I said, you know, when you're little kids, yeah, you're right. Maybe like George brought that earlier. Maybe that's a good message for a young child. Well, yeah, but my point was that it was an indoctrination routine oh, that yeah. influenced me and my generation, my age range people and partners unduly for years until we finally like it wasn't until my late 20s that I really started to think about it and try and understand the whole thing yeah uh, before that w- because of that just say no and the whole dare thing we had a preconceived like here's what's supposed to be right they keep telling me and it's not until you start thinking critically for yourself that you go I should analyze my previous beliefs and oh my goodness that's that's not so black and white is it yeah <laughs> so to my young friends out there Life can be great, but not when you can't see it. So open your eyes to life, to see it in the vivid colors that God gave us as a precious gift to his children, to enjoy life to the fullest and to make it count. Say yes to your life, and when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. If there was anything in this show you'd like to learn more about, the show notes which accompany each episode are full of links to click and explore. Catch up on past episodes and get pinged every time a new one's released by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. And you know, iTunes reviews help more than you know, so if you haven't yet, please rate and review us in the iTunes app. And if you have a friend who isn't yet listening, why not? Tell them about us, they'll thank you later. You're our fourth listener, and we'd love to read your emails right here on the show, so hit us up at podcast at genxgrownup.com. And finally, Gen X Grown Up is more than just this podcast. Our YouTube channel has hundreds of videos ready for you to enjoy. Plus, you can find our entire body of work on genxgrownup.com. Well, we certainly appreciate that you said yes to this just say no backtrack and you (laughs) stuck with us all the way to the end here. Uh, Before I leave, I want to do a kind of a little unscientific sampling that we have established that we're all two years apart uh, Mm -hmm. in in age. And so, George, you're the youngest born in 71, I believe, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what I want to ask you is what was your attitude toward the just say no campaign as it was happening? Not now, not in hindsight, not knowing what we know now. Was it cool? Was it dumb? Was it irrelevant? Was it stupid? Was it awesome? What was it to you? How did you experience it? Start with you, George. I mean, for me at that age, uh, as I think a lot of young people might be and from my background and situation, I was establishment all the way. I was wholly bought in. I wanted to be either oh, okay. a policeman yeah. or a military officer when I grew up. So to me, it wasn't about being cool, dumb or anything. It was necessary. That was the first step on that path. Yeah, I bought into it whole hog. Gotcha. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And now for my part, I was born two years earlier. I was born in 69. Uh, and, you know, because I was such a nerd and a dork, I really wasn't. Nobody asked me, John, would you like to smoke this? Because I didn't know anybody that did that. (laughs) I lived in a rural area, not in a city. And I didn't know any friends that had access to to drugs. And so literally in that age, no one asked me. And so for me, the Just Say No campaign was irrelevant. I didn't have visibility into the drug war. I didn't see people doing drugs in my little bubble of the world. So for me, it was background noise. It was irrelevant to me. I saw it. I knew what it meant. I mean, apparently it's a problem somewhere. 
where it doesn't affect me. Now, Mo, you were born even two years earlier than me in 67. Mm-hmm. So you were even older still when this came about. So what was your opinion toward it? <laughs> so, um, I mean, for me also, I guess growing up in the city, you know, it was a little bit different because, you know, one, drugs were everywhere. I mean, okay. you know, yeah, people sure. who smoked pot imagine. were everywhere. People with cocaine were everywhere around me. I, I have visited your your city in the interim. I'm aware of that. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, and, people, and it wasn't just like strangers. I mean, talking about family members, people I knew, friends, all that stuff. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 so sure. close to you. Oh, oh wow. absolutely. Okay. And the, the thing was, though, it was, you know, the whole just say no was honestly, it was almost like a joke in a sense, really? you know, especially for the old, because yeah. even, I take it back, even for the younger kids in my neighborhood, it was because it was like, you know, you hear people saying they're like, oh, you know, my mom said I have to go wash my clothes, something like that. And the kids were like, oh, just say no. You know, I mean, it was, you know, it was a punchline. It was a punchline mm-hmm. because gotcha. huh. it didn't really seem like it was really relevant or, and it, I definitely didn't feel like it really understood what was going on. Like gotcha. I said, it's, it's okay. tough to say if literally most of the people you know are doing it, it's hard, not that easy to say no. It and is, yeah. Everyone knows that, you know, especially kids, you know, peer pressure is a real thing, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, sure especially we get, and especially we see older people doing it, and, you know, around you and stuff. So from my standpoint, it just was not a, it, it was just like another thing that slogan that was out there that we were like, okay, whatever. Like I said, it got us out of class but it didn't really times. resonate with you as something that you wanted to embrace no. or anything like that. Gotcha. Yeah, absolutely okay. not. And so, yeah. and like, and one thing I want to bring up though, is that these are our opinions, right? Sure. And we are always open to listen to other opinions, assuming that it's an intelligent discourse <laughs> and not <I'm> somebody. Not. <laughs> are you trying to buffer the emails I'm that are going to come after all. this? <laughs> I know my opinion and I'm sticking to it. George no, no. is ready. Bring it no, on. Yeah. yeah. No. no, I mean, I think it was opinions. And like I said, I mean, hell, I mean, we're not, I don't think any of us are so ingrained that we're not willing to listen, right? I'm not. <laughs> Just said that. I'll, I'll listen for George, and I'll tell you what yeah, I heard. And I will listen too. I'll let you know. It may take a lot to convince me, but hey, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I'll listen. Sure, I will definitely listen. So, yeah, just trying to buffer the emails on this one a little bit. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen. I know that some parts of this are kind of a touchy subject, but just say no was was very front center for us when we were growing yeah. up. So I think it's a valuable thing to talk about. Thanks for that. Uh, before we leave, you know, we'd like to just take a few minutes here, right at the end, to give our gratitude to our patrons who support us financially over on Patreon. They keep the lights on here on the podcast, over on YouTube and on the website. We are so grateful for their belief and commitment to us. And in return, we want to thank them individually here, each and every one of you. So thank you so much. Dan Lee, Greg L. Slomo, Adam Steen, Greg Z, Greg Z Jonathan H. Travis, Blasted or Stash it, Mike C, Dana, Chad, Levi, Chet, Marcus, Jason, Arlem, Stubacca, Stu Monkey, Sean, Mark, T2, David, Agile, Shelby, Tony, Ben, Thomas, Davis, and Matt. Each and every one of Oof. you, amazing human beings. Thank you for your support and your commitment to us. If you would like to support what we do and you have not yet, Mo, would you tell the Fine Fourth listeners how they can get that rectified? Oh, absolutely. It's really easy. All you have to do is go to genxgrownup.com slash Patreon, and it'll take you right to our site where you can sign in and give whatever you can. The more you give, the more opportunities you have to get some of our behind the scenes footage and get some swag and some other things. Mm-hmm. If you're like a couple of our amazing, amazing members that give at the highest level, they even have some influence on our show and we ask them for opinions before we do things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, it's like anything anybody could give is always appreciated because it makes us feel that we're doing something that at least has some meaning to people. <laughs> and, for sure. Oh yeah. And, um, you know, and keeps us wanting to do more and more of this. So for the people who are out there who already give, thank you. And if you're thinking about it, you know, we'd really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I keep stealing George's comment that he made years ago. He, I think you're the one that said it puts fuel in the tank. It really keeps yeah. us motivated and energized. So grateful for each and every one of you patrons. That is going to wrap it up for this episode. We'll be back in two weeks with another backtrack, but next week, the regular edition of our show. Until then, I am John. George, thank you so much for being here. Yes, sir. Mo, you know I appreciate you. Always fun, man. Fourth listener, it's you. We appreciate most of all, though, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. See you guys. Take care, everybody. No life, no fun. Don't you know that you're a grown-up? Gen X Grown-Up is a member of the Evergreen Podcast family. Learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com. No shows till sunrise. Unacceptable for grown-ups. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown-up. I was about to ask Mo a question. I forget what it was. Uh, <laughs> Something you said earlier. I was going to riff. I should have wrote it down because uh, it was a good segue to get toward the end of this. Shit. Give me a second. Sorry, I'm high. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Are, you on, are you on the crack? Are you I'm on, on the, the crack? I'm on the weeds. All the weeds. <laughs> all the weeds. <laughs> Now, George, you're the youngest, born in the 72, I believe, right? 71. Oh, I'll do that again. Do you Sorry. not know when you were born? Oh, minus two. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> just, it would be math. plus two, but yes. Yeah, so okay. I was in the just say no assembly. I didn't cover math that day. Sorry. <laughs> Hit Pass Moto, sponsored by Moto America, is the show that keeps you up to speed on the latest in motorcycling and brings the biggest names in motorcycle racing right to you. From candid interviews with the top names in racing to providing insights into the trends and trendsetters driving the motorcycle industry, we have you covered. New episodes are available every Thursday at pitpassmoto.com and on your favorite podcast app. Ride on.